Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very excited to be here and I'm really happy to talk about this topic because it's really about my life. Um, so, my name is Julie Graham. I'm going to talk about being gender non-binary and talk a little bit about transgender people as well. I'm going to try and give you basic background on thinking about being non-binary. Um, and so I guess I'll start with uh, who I am. So I'm a therapist. Um, I'm a gender specialist. This is the only work that I've done for the last 15 years of my life is specifically around gender and gender identity. Um, I am a consultant and a trainer and all of that good stuff. But in terms of gender non-binary, it, it is who I am as a person. So I was a gender non-conforming kid. Um, and So as a kid, I was assigned female at birth, meaning that people looked at my body when I was a baby and said, oh, that's a girl. And I was trying to move through the world as me, and I was behaving in ways that people didn't think of as the ways that girls did things. Girls didn't behave the way that I behaved. They weren't interested in the things that I was interested in. So I was constantly in trouble in the world because I wasn't behaving and being the way I was supposed to be. As I grew up, I figured out that um, I wasn't straight, meaning that uh, given that I was assigned female at birth, I was not attracted to men, which is what I, people expected. So much of this talk is about what people expect and what people's realities are. So I knew I wasn't straight. Um, and so that was a helpful thing for me to have figured out. Uh, then I, I went to college, and I think that I was trying to sort out my gender identity then. I was a women's studies major, and in hindsight, I think that was trying to figure out how to make the category of women fit for me, because um, it really didn't. As a person who was sexually attracted to women but was assigned female at birth, people would think of me as butch, as a masculine woman. And I hated that, and that did not fit for me. Um, people always have expectations and assumptions, and they're always trying to fit you into labeled boxes that make sense to them, even if they don't make sense to you. Um, I knew that I wasn't butch. Um, that seems like that's something entirely different than who I am. So, but I was trying to just be me and have a life. Later on, when the word queer came out, that fit. It's like, oh good, there's a word that fits for me because queer was bigger and brighter and expansive. And queer isn't gendered. Um, lesbian is a gendered term. Um, and I never thought of myself as transgender. I wasn't in my mind what transgender was, I wasn't a man, I knew I wasn't a man, and I also knew that I wasn't a woman. So I just didn't, I, I basically was sliding through in the ways that I could. Then I heard the term genderqueer for the first time, and I thought, yes, that really fit me. That fits my gender identity, that, that's a match. So my gender is queer, my sexual orientation is queer. Um, with that, I'm somebody who doesn't use pronouns. So people will assume that I'm she. That's a very common thing. Um, unless I'm wearing a button-down shirt, for some, whatever reason, I get people assuming I'm he. Um, and use those pronouns with me. They'll say he, she, uh, hers his, and really I just decided not to use a pronoun, I just used my name. And if people feel like they have to use a pronoun with me, then using the pronoun they or them is the correct one to use. Um, and then we have these things called honorifics, Mr., Ms., Mrs., 
And the one for me is MX, mix. That's what you would use for me as a gender non-binary person. The other thing that I think is important for you to know about me in this talk is I am the parent of a child who was gender non-conforming when they were younger and is on the autism spectrum. Um, and there's an overlap of the autism spectrum and the gender spectrum, which is kind of a really cool and interesting thing. And still something we don't have a lot of understanding and awareness of, but we know it's true. Okay, so questions. Um, it, it works best for me if people hang on to questions until the end, because I might answer your question in the course of the talk. But if something's gonna interfere with your ability to focus, by all means, then please ask. I'm happy to answer that. All right, gender. So before I can talk about gender non-binary, I have to be able to talk about uh, gender um, and some definitions first. So gender all by itself can feel really confusing. People use the same word to mean different experiences. Same thing with sex. People use the word sex to mean um, a behavior that somebody has, and people use the word sex to mean a physiological identity, um, your biology, whether you have, have a penis or a vulva, whether your secondary sex characteristics will be breasts, where you'll have body hair, what your chromosomes are, all of that. It's a morphological category. Um, gender identity is different than that. Gender identity, and I need to separate these things out because people conflate them all the time. Um, gender identity is a person's internal experience. It's their felt sense of self in a gendered way. Some people will talk about soul or spirit, um, but it's somebody's internal experience of themselves as a gendered person, as man or woman, as male or female or something else. Um, as I said, sex is different. Sex is a cluster of biological traits. Um, when people are born, somebody looks at your body and says, oh, that person's a boy, that person's a girl. That's referred to as assigned. So somebody's sex assigned at birth. Um, a lot of medical providers don't like that. They basically feel like they're reporting what they see um, and not assigning it because um, they don't want to be seen as victimizing people in that way. Um, so somebody's, but that's what assigned at birth means. Uh, gender expression is how you express your gender identity. Um, it's the way you dress, the way you cut your hair, the way you move, the way you walk or talk. Um, there are many, many gendered behaviors um, because gender itself is a social construct that helps people categorize and organize information. Um, it helps people move quickly through social interactions. So somebody, whenever they first meet you, is going to assign you to a group, male or female, in their mind. And mostly they're going to be looking at your gender expression and maybe they're going to be looking at secondary sex characteristics like if you have a beard or you have breasts um, they're not looking at your gender identity because you can't see it it's internal so in this next slide i have a giant red line between gender identity sex gender expression, and sexual orientation. And the reason for that is sexual orientation is different from those other categories. Um, we have that acronym LGBTQ, and the I think about the Sesame Street thing of one of these things is not like the other, um, and sexual orientation doesn't fit. Four of those, LGB and Q are all sexual orientations, and one of them is gender identity. So people conflate sexual orientation and gender identity and get them all confused. 
um, sexual orientation or sexual preference, because for some people it is a sexual preference, um, is who we are emotionally or physically or romantically attracted to, whether we act on it or not. Um, you can be gay or lesbian and never have behaved in a way that, that uh, is interpersonal. Um, some people define it as an interpersonal category and it's not. It, it too is an identity um, as well as a way of being in the world. Um, there are other sexual orientations, like we talk about um, straight, gay, lesbian, bisexual. There's also asexual. Um, increasing numbers of people are identifying as asexual. And there are other ones like pansexual. And that's a whole other talk, just understanding sexual orientation and sexual preference. So now we get to talk about transgender a little bit. Transgender is an umbrella term. Um, it means a lot of different things. It means different things to different people. Some people like the term, some people don't like the term, um, but it is a way to talk about a particular experience that can be really, really helpful um, as an expedient form of language, I guess. So for us, so we have a common definition is it's anyone whose gender identity differs from their sex reported at birth. That's transgender. Um, transgender is, a, is based on, initially it was really based on the assumption of a gender binary. People are male or female. And then if those things, if your sex, the sex reported at birth, uh, lines up with your gender identity, then you're cisgender, and most people are. So if you were born and someone said, that's a boy, and you grew up and you felt your internal sense of self, felt male, felt man, then you're a cisgender person. Um, if you were assigned female at birth, and you, as you grow up, you feel female, you feel like a woman, um, then you're cisgender. Again, that's most people. For transgender people, it's folks who were assigned perhaps male at birth, but their internal gender identity is female, is as woman, or vice versa, that they were assigned female at birth and their internal identity is as male or masculine at, or um, man. So, for transgender folks, most transgender people are gender binary. They are identifying as male or female. Um, a third of them identify as non-binary. So when you talk about transgender, one of the first things people go to is transitioning and it's really important to understand what that is and what it means. Not everyone chooses to transition. There's no right way to transition. It's really about a person living as authentically as they can for themselves, identifying what they need their body to be like, what they need their voice to be like, what they need their face to be like, what they need, uh, their job, their family to be like, in terms of reflecting their um, identity. So a lot of it's internally, and there's a lot of choices that people can make, both socially and medically or surgically. When we talk about transition, people almost immediately go to surgery in their head, that that's what transitioning means. But the first part of transitioning is really just self-acceptance. Who am I? Oh, this is who I am. How do I come to um, embrace and grow, grow that experience in a society that doesn't appreciate or understand it? Um, so social transitioning is changing um, the way somebody might dress, the way they behave, the way they wear their hair, the way that we walk. All, all of those kinds of behaviors are gendered. 
um, hormonal interventions, people could take hormones, they could take um, medications that block hormones, um, they could choose to have a variety of surgeries, and they can choose to do none of those things at all. Um, they could change their name legally, they could change their gender legally. The thing is you don't have to. You don't have to dress differently, you don't have to take hormones, you don't have to have surgery, you don't have to change your name, you don't have to do anything to be yourself. Um, the goal is for people to figure out what they need and live that way. So you can be a woman assigned male at birth who doesn't physically transition and doesn't present or behave in typically feminine ways. Um, there's no rule about how to do this. You can be a male assigned female at birth without physically transitioning um, and without presenting or behaving in typically masculine ways. So transgender people thinking the, of them as being more binary um, don't have to do the things that people are expecting. Um, so there's what we see and who a person is. And you can tell absolutely nothing about a person's gender identity by looking at them. You can tell absolutely nothing by their name. You can tell absolutely nothing by the sound of their voice over the phone. Um, so people may or may not be behaving, working, dressing in ways that are typical. They may not have typical female bodies. They're still women or men or whoever it is that they say they are. Um, I love this comic. I think it's, this is uh, an artist who goes by assigned male. Um, the comic is, I'm not a girl in a boy's body, because that's this myth. I'm a man in a woman's body. I'm a woman in a man's body. This frame that popular society has grabbed onto. Um, so the character says, I'm a girl. This is my body. Girls have all kinds of bodies. Um, so somebody might assume from looking at her all kinds of things about her body. We don't know what's under her clothing, and it's none of our business. She is who she says she is. So you can't tell anything by looking at folks. Um, part of why I'm talking about transgender people here is certainly a lot of gender non-binary people identify as transgender, but a lot of people get confused about this. So some people understand the concept of transgender, but they think a person must transition from one binary position to the other. If you aren't a girl, you must be a boy, and vice versa. You change your body, you change your how you dress, all of it. But honestly, that's still a binary model. That is moving from one gender binary to the other. And that's just not true um, for a lot of people. So talking about beyond the binary. Again, this is all about identity. So we have this binary where people are male or female. And it's a false belief. And people will always, I, I do a lot of talks and people will say, you know, that it's not natural, which I think is funny because it's not based in reality. So it's a false belief that in nature there's only two sexes or genders. So I'll just show you a couple of slides that I just think are kind of interesting and fun about this. Um, so a clownfish. This, this is the fish that was in the Disney movie Nemo. When the female dies, the largest male becomes a female. So that's a, a physical body changing its own sex. Um, this is a, another fish, a California sheep's head. It begins life as female, and later in life, it may become male, and then it changes its color. It um, goes from being all pink to being black and pink. I love these pictures. These are gynandromorphic butterflies. 
On one side, they're female. On the other side, they're male. Female butterflies are, are duller in color than male butterflies. Male butterflies, I guess the thought is to attract females. They're very brightly colored. Um, and so on one side, you can see a male butterfly. On the other side, you see a female butterfly. This cardinal is the same. So on one side, this cardinal is what we know as a typical male cardinal. On the other side, the cardinal is female. Nature is really cool. This is a male lion. Everybody knows that's a male lion. It has the big mane and is just the typical picture of a male lion that we all grew up with. This looks like it's a male lion. It's got the big mane, but this is actually a female lion. Looks just like a male lion. Like I said, you can't tell anything from just looking. So I have this picture to show you that, you know, this lion definitely has female genitalia, anatomically female. Um, but it looks like what we expect a typical male lion to look like. And lions who are like this are, behave more in more masculine ways uh, for lions. There are typical behaviors male lions have and typical behaviors female lions have, and they behave in ways that are typical of male lions. So nature, isn't binary, it's a spectrum. So I showed you pictures of animals that can change their sex, that they're fluid in terms of their anatomy. Animals that have aspects of both sexes, um, their bodies change, um, or their bodies are inter what we would think of as intersex. And then there are animals that are genetically one sex, but behave like another sex, um, and can even look like another sex. So nature is vast and incredible, and it is not binary. It's people that are binary. People sort and organize information. We like to categorize, and then we come up with rules or if we're not creating them ourselves personally, we're adapting social rules. The things that we grew up hearing in school, um, in, from our families, from the media, and we adopt those social rules, that there's female and there's male, and they behave in different ways. And those rules, those are gender, that's the social construct. When we interact with people, it's based on those gender-related rules. Um, we do, we behave differently with people we identify to be men and people we identify to be women. There's things that it might be okay to say to a man that it's not okay to say to a woman in our society and vice versa. Um, there are things that it, it's okay to do and not do. So those are um, social, socially constructed gender rules and roles. The first thing we do when we meet somebody is figure out if we're talking to a man or a woman and adjust. Um, I think we also do that with race. We change how we behave and what we say when we're talking to someone from a different race. So what we just saw with the animal kingdom is that it's a, it's a spectrum. It's not just male, it's not just female. There's something in between. Um, so we talk about it as a spectrum. And that spectrum is being non-binary. Non-binary is also an umbrella term. It's another term that all kinds of things get thrown to. Um, so some non-binary folks are people who are both bi both binary genders simultaneously. They identify as being both male and female. Um, some non-binary folks are people who are fluid. Um, they shift. Um, 
they some days they feel female some days they feel man male they dress and behave in those ways um, and this can be hard for other people who insist that people stay in a fixed rigid role um, there are people who feel gender has no importance in their identity at all that gender is simply irrelevant there are people who feel like they are a third gender people for whom neither man or woman fits neither male or female fits um, so there's a range of ways that people could identify um, and we have this spectrum model that i showed you from before this nice spectrum well there are people for whom gender is just not a relevant category it feels like it doesn't apply to them um, and it's incredibly unimportant generally those folks um, are identifying as agender um, but there are other ways that they could identify as well so when i talk about gender i talk about it as a galaxy there are so many different ways that a person can identify. So they might identify as pangender, masculine of center. They might identify as transsexual. Um, they might identify as a boy, as neutroi or neutroi. People pronounce it uh, different ways. Androgynous, neutral, neuter. There's a range of words that can fit under the gender galaxy, under that umbrella. And it's important for people to find their own words. That, that's an important piece of this. And people can have more than one of these. They can identify as transgender and gender non-binary and masculine of center. Um, increasingly, I feel like people are embracing more than one um, gender identity. These are the Facebook categories. Most of them, as you can see, are starting off with either cisgender or trans or trans with a, a, of, um, one of those little stars, an asterisk, or um, some variation on the word trans, transsexual, transgender, transmasculine. But there certainly are others. And this is all just going to keep expanding. And something small like Facebook adding these categories to choose from is actually huge because it lets people know these categories, these folks who fit into those categories are out there. So gender identity and gender expression um, when you're non-binary. Here's the thing, people just wanna live as themselves. Um, they wanna be seen and honored and respected as themselves. Models that are um, hetero or cis normative really might not work at all for folks and they want to have space in a new model I think most people me excuse me mostly people are just trying to be comfortable and live their lives um, in order to do that some people might try and minimize gender characteristics other people might want to blend them some people are muting them some people are going back and forth um, or mixing them you know so somebody who has a beard and is wearing a skirt um, those things just because you have a beard doesn't mean you can't wear a skirt people find this as a very creative flexible open place to be there's no correct or iconic way to be gender queer or gender non-binary um, when I started to identify as gender non-binary and gender queer i think people expected me um, to make all of these changes in my life and for me it was just oh this is who i am it wasn't um oh i'm going to become something else i'm just getting to be me and there's a word for it now um i think People expected me to have a mixed presentation in terms of typical gender expression. Um, and I just wanted to be me. So 
how somebody might express their gender is really based on how they see themselves and how they want to move through the moment. Um, there aren't rules and there's no correct way to do this. So part of what we want is for people to figure out what do they need? What do you need to feel the way you want to feel? How do you live in a way that is congruent for you? What would make you feel whole? What would improve the quality of your life? For some people, they'll do that with a therapist, sort that out. Increasingly, people can find places online to do that, can find groups of other folks to do that with. But those are the big questions I think that people need to answer um, in order to guide their gender journey. People will bring up transition, physical transition. And, you know, there's a whole range of ways that people could express themselves. Um, so for a lot of people, it's not transitioning as much as it's owning or perhaps transitioning the people around them to understand and relate to them in an appropriate way. Um, they're not having to change anything about themselves. Um, I think for some folks, finding a label in the gendered galaxy can really, really help. Finding, um, changing their name, finding a name that they want to hear. Um, so somebody who has a very, very gendered name that might be very hard for them if they're a non-binary person. And so they may need to find a more androgynous name. Um, somebody might choose to take hormones and they might um, take hormones in a very different way than a transgender person might. Um, and again, I'm using transgender in the way of somebody who's transitioning in a particular way. Um, so folks might take low dose hormones. They might take hormones until they get the physical changes that they want and then stop. So for instance, somebody who was assigned female at birth might take testosterone to get facial hair and to um, get more muscular. And then after they reach that, then they stop taking that hormone. They stop taking testosterone. And slowly over time, they may lose some of the gains they made from that piece of their physical transition, but that may be exactly what they want. Some, some folks might take estrogen or a androgen blocker to soften their facial features. Much of what happens with secondary sex characteristics um, is they are what gender your body. So once people hit puberty, physical things happen like getting breasts um, or your face changing. Um, men have a very, are, are more likely to have very distinct brow ridge to have a defined a kind of defined chin to be more angular um so somebody might want to soften those physical facial features and take um hormones to do that but you have to know what it is that somebody wants like what are they what are they what would make someone happy what would make them feel whole? Um, and so that's going to really vary by how someone defines and sees themselves. So for instance, if somebody were gender neutral or androgynous and needed their body to be different, what they might do is have secondary sex characteristics like their facial structure be addressed and have their face more androgenized. I don't know if that's a word, but um, 
So if somebody has strong, what are considered typical male features, to have those softened, to have a, a, a more female appearance, even if they're gonna keep their penis, even if they're gonna keep other aspects of their body, it might be their face that's causing them to be uncomfortable and they're wanting to be more accurately seen as androgynous. Um, people might want a flat body. They might want, they might not want breasts. They might not want a penis. They really just want to be neutral. So having no secondary sex characteristics. Um, for other people, they might want to be both. So they might want a penis and a vagina and a vulva and breasts. Um, and people might want to try to take um, hormones and take them on and off. There's a range of ways that people might work with medical technology in their bodies to be able to find what fits for them. There's no correct way to be transgender and there's no correct way to be non-binary. There are no rules about you have to do it a particular way. It really is what I said before about what do you need to feel the way you wanna feel? What is it that you can change in your life that's gonna make you feel better? Um, so identifications, you know, our, all the language that we have is really complicated. Language is changing um, as we evolve in our understanding of gender, the language changes, everything changes. So it's very, very important though to understand how somebody sees themselves and use the language that that person uses. Um, so a, a non-binary person might identify as transgender and they may not. A transgender person might also identify as non-binary or they may not. So there's um, an overlap here, but not necessarily always. Um, so I'm a non-binary person and I don't identify as trans. I have friends who are non-binary who absolutely do identify as trans. I have friends who are trans who um, embrace non-binary as well. So understanding how somebody's holding that um, instead of making assumptions that if you're non-binary, you're trans, or if you're trans, you have non-binary aspects or you don't, that you're only binary. It's very, very complicated. Early on, I was talking in a way that made transgender people sound more binary because most transgender people are very binary, but a third of them are not. Um, every non-binary person has their own definition, um, their own self understanding and awareness. So people might need their pronouns to be different. I have a friend who's non-binary who was female assigned at birth and she uses she pronouns. I don't use pronouns. Um, I have a really good friend who was assigned uh, male at birth and uses female pronouns um, and uses the word they, them as pronouns. So people could choose from any of those and it would be correct. So you need to understand from that person what their pronouns are that person might need to change their name or not. Um, they may be comfortable with or need for people to use the correct pronouns or they may not even care about that. Um, it really varies. And the goal is to respect the person that you're talking with and to live the way that fits for you. Um, people's need for external affirmation really varies. Um, some people really, really need to be seen as themselves and other people, they don't really care about people. Um, like for instance, if I'm in a cab and I get misgendered, I don't care. I'm not invested in that cab driver at all. That's not worth my time to educate them. 
I'm just trying to get to the airport, for instance. Uh, so some of it's contextual, what we do um, around this. Um, people are going to express their identity differently if they choose to. You don't always have to express your gender identity. Um, there's some really good reasons around safety that people don't express their gender identity. Um, there might be people that you're comfortable expressing your whole self with and other people that you're not. And all of that's valid. So let's talk about language and the grammar thing. So this is from um, an educational website. And it shows you all of the different um, ways to use non-binary pronouns and binary pronouns too. So they, them, they are theirs, themselves. These are all single, singular pronouns. And I guess a couple of things, um, language changes. And actually there's, the word they has been a singular pronoun for a long time. It just isn't commonly used in that way. The American Dialect Society um, for the year 2015 picked they, um, as a gender neutral singular pronoun, as their word of the year. There's been a lot of attention to language and people can change their language. Yes, it's hard. We've all been socialized into this binary way of thinking and relating to folks, but really we can make changes um, to make the world a more comfortable place for other folks. Things that are like that too are just the way we talk. Um, if you go somewhere, people like to a performance, people will say, ladies and gentlemen. Well, um, you could instead uh, um, come up with an inclusive way to say that. Like, hello, everybody. Um, Saying, hello ladies, hi guys. The word guy can be a real issue for a lot of people because it, some people don't think that is a gendered um, word and other people do. Um, saying, when people are trying to be polite and they're saying, yes sir, yes ma'am, that can be really, really hard um, for people who are gender non-binary or for people who are being misgendered. Um, and we don't have to use that language. You know, we can uh, just use the person's name. Um, we can say, uh, you folks, instead of you guys. We can uh, just say hello to people instead of hello, sir. And let people be themselves and not have to have them be immediately put in a box whenever they're relating to people. So practicing gender neutral ways of greeting people, of interacting, is really, really giving people space to come out as themselves. I thought I'd just throw these in. This is the, uh, just like there's an LGB, uh, um, a gay flag, there's also a non-binary flag, there's a genderqueer flag, there's a trans flag. There are all kinds of flags. So I just thought I'd throw these out there for people to see. Um, I, again, it's about folks taking up space and being seen. Um, kids. So there was, a, I thought this was really interesting. There was a, um, every year in California, there's something called the California Health Interview Survey and the data comes out a couple of years later. So from the 2015 to 2016 one, 27% of California youth aged 12 to 17 report that they're viewed by other people as gender nonconforming at school. So this isn't asking people about their own gender identity. This is other people's perceptions of you and your experience of that. Um, 
6.2 of those California youth um, self-reported that they were highly gender non-conforming and about 21% of them identified as androgynous. So that's a huge cultural change. If a quarter of, of kids in school are, identif are being perceived as gender non-conforming, hopefully that's going to shift what happens in school because generally in school it's not okay to be gender non-conforming. Part of the whole idea of gender as a construct is gender gets policed. Um, and schools are one of the major places where that happens, where people try and make you fit into one of the binary categories. So we see a lot of bullying um, around kids not being conforming to their genders. I was certainly bullied as a kid. I was bullied in my own family around being not binary. Um, it's a very common thing and common experience for folks to have because it is a piece of how social rules and roles are enforced and they're enforced by peers in um, some pretty painful ways. So that leads me to just talking about some issues in general. Um, a lot of folks may have someone in their life who's non-binary and may not know it. Um, they also may know it, the person might have told them and it got dismissed. I know whenever I told my family I was genderqueer, nobody even asked me anything about it. I think it was more of, oh yeah, that's just more of, of who you are. And I, and I don't know what it means and I'm not going to even ask. So people have a lot of myths and beliefs about how folks are and how we're moving through the world. Um, and, you know, like, I, I certainly think people saw me as confused and I really wasn't confused. I haven't changed a whole lot um, or, or any from the time that I was a child to now in terms of how I see myself and how I move through things. I experimented there for a while to try and see if I could fit, but, you know, I, I've never fit in the binary. So seeing us as confused, and that's really pretty offensive. Um, the same as seeing it as a fad, that this gender thing is this new fad. It's not a fad. You know, again, people have been who they are all along. Um, people will write it off as a political thing, um, that it's folks trying to be transgressive. While it's true that some folks are trying to subvert the binary and that it is a political issue, it doesn't mean that all non-binary people are doing that. And it also doesn't mean that there aren't binary people out there taking this on as a political issue to make the world safer for non-binary folks. Um, that it's a phase. So sometimes the phase is connected to the confused thing um, that people are projecting onto us. And sometimes it can even come from inside the transgender community where people are thinking that being non-binary is a developmental step towards being um, binary transgender. So somebody's just not ready to come out as trans yet, as trans male or trans female. Um, so they're being non-binary as a step along the way. It's, that's certainly possible, and it's also possible in the other direction where somebody is being trans until they figure out they're non-binary. There are developmental things that happen all over the place, that's true. But seeing it as a phase um, is, again, a really offensive thing. Um, I know who I am. Um, it's not something that's going away. Um, it would have gone away a long time ago if it was a phase. Um, that people being either dysphoria, gender, having gender dysphoria or not having gender dysphoria. Some folks will think gender non-binary people don't have dysphoria about their bodies, uh, don't have dysphoria about their gender roles, and it's simply a different manifestation for some folks. So people may be dysphoric, 
or they may not. They may be just fine with who they are and it's the world that needs to change. So gender non-binary folks, we may or may not tell you who we are. And there are really good reasons to not disclose. So in one, I think this was the National Transgender Discrimination Study, 86% of people reported that they do not understand, reported that people they're talking with don't understand, so they don't want to even bother to explain. Like, you're not going to get it. That's kind of my family. I said what I am and what that meant, and they didn't get it, and they, and they so didn't get it, they didn't even know how to ask about it. Um, that 82% of people reported it was easier not to say anything. <clears throat> you know, in various settings, we're going to make different choices. If, um, like I said, the cab driver thing, you know, I certain there actually are people who are service providers like that who have misgendered me and I have corrected them. And, but most of the time, I'm just trying to get through my day, get through stuff. I'm not trying to educate the world. Um, it's definitely easier not to constantly correct somebody. Um, and that's one of the fundamental things about respect. If you correct somebody once, that's okay. If you have to keep correcting them, then it's kind of hostility from that person directed at you, that they're really being disrespectful. Um, and I, I actually think it's a power issue. Um, so people are gonna choose whether or not they're gonna take up space as their identity because they're gonna be dismissed, they're gonna not be understood, or people fear that um, something bad will happen. 43% of people in that study, they feared violence. Um, discrimination is real. Violence is real. Uh, verbal violence and physical violence. Um, that 63% reported non-binary identity often dismissed or not being understood as the real identity or just a phase. That's the problem with the phase thing. Um, this is who I am, it's not a phase. Legally, California just accepted that there was a third gender and people are now allowed to put that on their driver's license. Oregon and Washington both have had it, have a third gender. Oregon lets you change your birth certificate. It will be much harder to dismiss or ignore gender non-binary folks um, when people have the correct legal status. So now in the state of California, they're going to have to change all of those forms that, you, that I encounter all the time that say male or female on them. And I have to cross those out and put in another box that says non-binary. Now everybody's got to do that. And the fact that that's happening means that other people who might be binary who see that on a form are going to think, oh, there's another category. I didn't know that. That's going to help everybody. Um, thinking that this is a fad. Gender non-binary people have always existed throughout time and across cultures. Um, there are cultures that didn't conceptualize of gender as a binary, so they didn't have the same kind of language that, that we're using, this very binary language. So people will talk about there being a third gender. Some people use that um, as a, use the term two-spirit as a way to understand gender non-binary folks. That, that is a really important term that gets misused by a lot of folks. Um, there were cultures that um, other people, other cultures, binary cultures, looking at them said that they had you know, third, five, or even seven genders, because there were just different conceptualizations about it. There were genders that, uh, there were cultures that, you know, uh, um, had shamans who early on had, were raised in a different binary sex category. Um, 
to be able to embrace aspects of both male and female if you have a binary category. So this has been true throughout time. And I mostly don't like to talk about it because I feel like there's something about it where I don't have the language to respectfully represent other cultures. Um, so I would just encourage folks to go do that research on their own. Um, to look at indigenous cultures before binary Western ideas were imposed on, on those cultures. Something else that's true is there very likely are more people of color who identify as non-binary. Um, I think it was the National Trans Discrimination Study where 30% of people who identified as non-binary, um, I'm gonna say this wrong, that 30% of people who identified as non-binary were white and 23, I knew I was gonna say it wrong, 30% for people of color as opposed to 23% um, of white folks. There was another study, the National Lesbian, Gay, National Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender, Queer, um, I'm forgetting what T stands for in this, in this moment, um, did another study and a third of, um, the people who identified as gender non-binary were less likely to be white. They were more likely to be black, multiracial or Asian, not Hispanic or Latina. Um, and a third of folks who identified as transgender also identify um, as non-binary. Another statistic is that there's more younger people. And whenever they're saying younger people, they're talking about people under 45. They're not necessarily talking about 12 year olds. Um, so gender non-binary folks have always existed. Um, there may be uh, more of us in different cultural groups. Um, there's just a lot we don't know. We don't collect data in a way that works for people to let them take up space. And we also now have um, a lot of anti-transgender sentiment coming from the federal government, which makes it unsafe for people to disclose their identities. So we have problems with data collection in the first place because the forms, most forms say male and female. Um, and maybe they say male, female, and other, and others are really offensive thing to refer to folks as. Um, so we don't have good data collection still. And now we have a, a complicated political situation. Bathrooms. Bathrooms can be really, really uncomfortable if you're perceived to be gender nonconforming or you're perceived to be transgender. Um, bathrooms are a place where lots of gender policing happening, lots of gender policing happens, and people are afraid um, in bathrooms because there really is violence that can happen. I was just traveling and if at some airports have gender neutral or family bathrooms, and I, I actually try and use those um, because I'm more comfortable. Um, and when I don't, I have people, I just had um, a woman say to me, this is, this is the women's room. And I said, yeah, I know. And they're like, it's the women's room. And I'm like, yeah, I know. And then I realized that that was, you know, she's gender policing me. And I, I, it's hard to have clever, witty responses whenever you're just trying to run off because you need to, to pee. Um, so bathrooms are really uncomfortable places. And if there isn't a gender neutral bathroom, then we're going to encounter people staring at us 
I definitely have people staring at me trying to figure out what I am. And I know that's what they're thinking. Um, so we have people who are staring at us. We have people who make comments, people who do that, people who say that you're in the wrong restroom. Um, and then there are people who will call the police or call security. Those are all really upsetting things when you're just simply needing to take care of a bodily function. Um, so bathrooms are certainly an issue for gender non-binary folks. Um, I'm going to skip this slide for a moment. So assumptions. We are constantly making assumptions in this society and it determines how we relate to people and whether we're making space for gender diversity. Um, it means we're not making those assumptions. It means that we're being aware of them. Um, it might also mean that we take on challenging the root of those assumptions, both individually and socially. It's really important to ask and not assume. One of the important pieces of gender neutral bathrooms is it makes space for me to exist as a person. There, there's a place for me to go where I'm not gonna experience people trying to control what I'm doing. Um, and that matters. Um, it's really important that people ask and don't assume things about another person. Um, but asking questions can be a really good thing and it can also be a way to harass people and can be really uncomfortable. We learn about each other and ways of being through interacting. But if you're going to ask somebody about their gender identity or things about their body, you really need to get permission. You, and the person needs to be in a position where they can actually consent. Sometimes people ask questions and you have no choice but to answer them. Um, and so it has to really be a choiceful thing. The person has to have the right to say no in order for them to really be consenting to having this conversation with you. So you have to get permission first. And then you need to know, you're not the first person to ask me this. Um, you're not the, it's very unlikely that you're going to have new, some new insight into gender identity that the person you're talking to hasn't had. So it, light bulbs might be going off for you, but they went off for the person you're talking to a long time ago. So know that you're basically asking someone to educate you um, by having a conversation with you about their gender and how they understand it. Um, be really careful of asking inappropriate questions. Inappropriate questions can range from asking somebody what their what name they were given as a child um, when they were born. For some people, that name really is a trigger um, and a problematic thing, and asking them that is really invalidating. If you can't tell what sex somebody was assigned at birth, it's really inappropriate to ask somebody what sex they were born as. It's incredibly inappropriate to ask people about their bodies. Do you have a penis? Um, that, that actually starts to head into sexual harassment and really would be considered sexual harassment in say a work situation. Um, it's nobody's business. So, Gender non-binary and transgender people are exoticized and folks think it's okay to ask things that it's really inappropriate to ask. Um, so it's a complicated thing, but you need to ask people some questions like what's, your, what's the name that you use? What's the pronoun I should use? when I'm referring to you, those are really appropriate questions to ask. Um, depending on how well you know somebody, it might be incredibly appropriate to ask what their gender identity is, how they understand their gender identity and what they want you to reflect back to them. Um, and there are all of these other questions that come from curiosity that are really inappropriate to ask somebody. Um, healthcare discrimination is a for real issue. So 
we have issues in this country around transgender people getting access to care. Gender non-binary folks as a different category or a subset of transgender is even more confusing. So somebody might understand that slide I showed earlier about they understand somebody um, was assigned male at birth, but they have a female identity and that that person's going to want to physically transition, um, perhaps. And the uh, primary care provider might know how to do hormones to help that person physically transition. And they may have no idea at all how to do low dose hormones with somebody who only wants to um, find the place where they feel authentic themselves, where they feel at home in their bodies themselves. So it's hard to find care. It's very hard to find trained providers um, and then providers who don't have the binary bias who then do all of that dismissive stuff that I talked about before with myths and all, or see people see it as a phase or people think you're really crazy, um, that it's an identi um, a, a psychological identity problem, an identity crisis, things like that. Um, that's language that really doesn't fit. Um, and then I think for a lot of providers who've never worked with us, we're guinea pigs. They don't know how to work with us, and so they're going to try, but they're not informed and somehow don't feel like they need to go get educated, even though we exist. We're part of the population. It would be important to know how to care for everyone, everybody in the population, um, that folks don't feel that need to go get trained. So healthcare discrimination is a real issue. Um, still, in most places, you get a form, and the form is going to be irrelevant for a gender non-binary person. It's going to talk about what is your sex um, and it's not going to talk about what are your body parts that uh, a physician might need to know. What is your gender identity? How do you understand your gender identity? What are the pronouns you need to use? Those are the things that actually should be on forms that are not. Um, and every time um, a gender non-binary or a transgender person actually interacts with one of those forms, it, it, it's a hassle um, and, and it can actually trigger gender dysphoria for people. So healthcare needs to really shift to take good care of people. Um, now I'm gonna go back to that slide that was out of place. Sexual orientation and preference and dating. Um, dating can be really hard when you're gender non-binary because often dating is thought to be a pretty binary thing. Um, so like language, for instance, like language related to sexual orientation is gendered, lesbian, right? So we have this very bi binary model around this. Dating apps and um, uh, groups can be very, very gendered. You know, you fill out a form to be matched with somebody else and those forms often just aren't a fit. Then there are things like, um, you know, people are sexually attracted to certain body parts. That's the true thing. Um, so when somebody's saying, what they're looking for, are they looking for gender or are they looking for body parts? Okay, I uh, get myself lost. All right, I'm nearing the end here. And I've there, there was a, a comment um, that's saying that this is comprehensive and educational and accessible, which is great because that's is kind of what I try to do. Um, and I can't move that little thing off my screen. So I want to say two more things, and I can't figure out how to get that off my screen, but 
family, friends, coworkers, the goal here is to make space for other people and to um, have language change, to have interactions change, to have respect change. Um, that's really what we're trying to do and trying to look for. Um, let's see if I can do it this way. It might be hard for uh, other people to live in the space of not knowing details about somebody's body, for instance, but it's not necessarily their business. We, we all want to be, re, inter, be related to just as people. So it really is about respect, making space, respecting language. The other thing I want to talk about just briefly is gender is just a piece of who folks are. Um, and we can pull gender out and hyper focus on it when there's all these other aspects of people too. So now that's the end of it. And I'm going to try and figure out how to interact with the question part. I thought I knew. Yeah. So I think I need help with this. Okay. So I guess at this point, if there are questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, and I, Joanne was gonna, okay. What's your best recommendation for parenting a gender non-conforming kiddo? Ah, I, and I learned how to do this from having a gender non-conforming kid. Um, and there is this overlap for the autism spectrum. Our, a, our ASD kiddo is now identifying as a boy slash girl. What advice can you provide us about the combination of ASD and gender creative kiddos? First off, it's great that you're using language like gender creative. That's fabulous. Um, so the first thing that you're trying to do, whether you have a child on the autism spectrum or a child that is on the gender spectrum, is for them to uh, be safe in the world, for them to be respected, understood, and to be able to um, be creative, to explore. So you as a parent, what you're trying to do is make the world safe for your kid and running all that preemptive interference to make sure that your kid's gonna be okay. So you're gonna interact with grandparents who aren't okay with this and help educate them. Um, you're gonna interact with school systems that aren't okay with this and help educate them. And you're gonna give them the space to explore. That's really, really critical, is that kids get to have the space to explore. Um, and a big chunk is you have to do all of your own work. All of your own work around autism spectrum, all of your own work around gender. We are socialized to have um, experiences and beliefs about this that we all have to unlearn in order to be good parents to the child that's in front of us, you can, the child that's in front of you. Okay. Can you hear me, Julie? I can now hear you. Okay, great. Um, we have one person who made um, a lengthy comment in the chat box that I can read to you. Um, it says, I really appreciate this webinar and presentation. Something I just wanted to mention is that the phenomenon is a phenomenon that myself and my other trans friends have encountered. The well-intentioned rhetoric of you don't have to transition to be valid gets weaponized against us and used to gatekeep us out of access to medical transition. It's sometimes used to prop up cis anxieties that frame trans bodies as maimed cis bodies and medical transition as something scary and unnecessary. Certainly it's true that you don't have to do anything particular to be your gender, but in the rush towards, you don't have to medically transition, in quotes. The fact that countless people still do not have access to medical transition in the first place sometimes gets lost. 
There's been recent um, attention from community clinic research and providers around autistic adolescents who are also gender non-conforming or trans and access to medical transition is a crucial issue for the population as it is for trans. Okay, so yeah, that's all true. So okay. I, I always forget to sort of talk about, I'm, I run a gender program in the city of San Francisco. And so I'm coming from a really privileged place where people do have access to care and do have access to care that it is, that is nuanced you know, that is actually responsive. You can get access to surgery to feminize your face if you're an androgynous person. Um, and, you know, all over the world, quite honestly, places are at different, um, uh, regions are at different places in their understanding of this. Pretty much anything that people say can get weaponized and used against groups of folks. Um, so, yeah. Saying that identity is valid is um, it, you, that not transitioning uh, is a valid choice. People can grab onto that sentence and beat up their kid with it. And the goal is really for people to know who their kid is or for an adult to know who they are themselves and get access to the care that they need. And there's lots and lots of different ways for people to um, physically transition if that's what they need to. Um, folks on the autism spectrum are seen as being unable to give consent uh, to their own care. They're seen as um, it, it gets dismissed, their gender identity gets dismissed as some aspect of um, the autistic experience. There's again, a lot of ways to, to take stuff away from folks instead of listening to them. And a piece of what we really have to do as a society is listen to people and provide them with what they need and not um, control uh, in the ways that we have. Um, both groups of people, and I used to do a presentation about gender and autism, or I, I guess I still do it, I'm doing it in a couple of weeks. And one of the things I show is how many overlaps the gender community has with the autism community in the way that other people are relating to them, in the degrees to which people are bullied, in the ways to which people get inadequate, ir um, unresponsive health care. There are so many different pieces to that. So um, yes, things can be weaponized, and we have to figure out how to not let that happen. Um, the fact that somebody is on the autism spectrum does not mean that they don't have the right to make choices about how they express their gender. It's just not true. Um, and that's coming from a really, really patronizing, paternalistic place. So I think that's the piece of it that I can say to that. Um, okay. Do you got another one, Joanne? I do. So another one is, who is a good professional for us to bring our child to to help explore his gender? Is the best person a psychologist or rather a doctor who specializes in gender? Um, they live in the Boston area and their child is a first grader. So there are um, definitely resources in Boston for gender. And I think the best person to take your child to is somebody who's going to understand your child. Um, and not like, again, if your kid's on the autism spectrum, there's a lot of autism specialists that will not embrace somebody's gender related concerns. If, um, and the same thing's true on the gender spectrum that you take your child to somebody who's a gender specialist and they don't understand autism and there are people on the autism spectrum who are transitioning can have different needs it doesn't mean that they don't get the transition they might have different needs um, there's issues about physical sense physical and sensory experiences connected to transition and all of that so the best person to take your kid to is somebody who's really going to understand your child 
Um, and as I said, there definitely are, Boston has people who are working with uh, kids on both the gender and autism spectrum. Some really decent work has come out of there. Uh, so that's, you know, there's, you really do have a lot of options. So whether it's a psychologist or a doctor or a therapist or a psychiatrist, or it, it's a whole range. It, it really, a developmental pediatrician who understands that's the key part to me. Okay, thank you. Another question is, how do you start the conversation with a teenager who feels as though they don't fit within their body, yet they won't consider the idea that um, there's any other piece? So parents want to fix things. Um, and actually a lot of adolescents don't necessarily want to talk with their parents about their, uh, gender identity or sexuality. So th that's one thing I just want to put out there. It's not necessarily parents who are going to get that, um, and, and, and a number of kids get really, really quiet at a certain point in, in terms of processing this. Um, so I think that the thing you do is you demonstrate that you are open to listening when they are ready to talk to you. You demonstrate that your world has space for differences and diversity in gender, that that's very, very important, that that's the world that your child gets to live in. Um, but I don't think there's a magic way to get a kid to talk about things that we as parents want them to talk about. Uh, everybody processes differently. Um, they may understand things differently and need a different path forward than the one that parents might think they do. And I know that's a really unsatisfying answer, but I honestly think it's, the, it's what's true, is you make space, for your kid to be able to talk to you about this when they're ready. Um, if somebody's uncomfortable in their body, um, that, that could mean a whole range of different things. Uh, and so like I, I would need way more details about that. Uh, lots of people are uncomfortable in their body. And, you know, so that may be a, uh, a gender thing that may not be a gender thing. I'd need a whole lot of more information, but demonstrating that diversity is really okay. It is cool. And whoever your kid is, is fabulous. Um, and my basic belief is that your kid will eventually let you know what they need you to know about their needs. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have time for about one more question. If anyone um, has something that they'd like to share, um, we'll give them just a couple of minutes. Um, in the meantime, Julie, thank you so much for this talk. It's been excellent. Um, I, I'd love to learn more about your the talk you're going to be giving soon about uh, gender and autism. So I'll uh, I'll send you an email about that. Um, and here's one, here's one question. Um, can you speak about the ways in which cultural miso misogyny involve, including violence by males towards females, can affect identity formation in young female people? That's a really interesting question, and it's very complex, because it's another one of those things where I can give you a some information about that, but then sometimes that information gets used to make it seem like somebody's not gender non-binary or not trans. Um, so certainly trauma and misogyny affects um, people's identity development. That's absolutely true. Um, and it doesn't mean it, it is a developmental thing. 
where that might be so and somebody might be identifying in a particular way at um, 17 and then at 25 they work through that so that that's a possible thing but again that frame can get used against people who that's just not true for yes it's miso society is misogynist yes there's violence and this person is still trans this person is still male this person is still female so it, the and I, I sort of regret I didn't say this at the beginning but when I work with people or do talks the answer to any question is really it depends um, and you cannot use because it's so individual and case by case you can't use information about one person to, to apply to another person or one situation to apply to another situation um, so for me the answer to that is yeah we're all affected by misogyny um, whether you're male female or non-binary we are all affected by that in one way or another and part of the deal is we're all trying to work to change that and to fix that in society um, and i don't think there's a simple way to tease out how we would be affected by that in terms of each individual's identity development because everyone's different. So again, that's a non, a very not satisfying answer, I think. Um, but it's true. Well, thank you for that. And we, um, we have run out of time. So I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. And Julie, thank you again for this talk. Um, thank you. I'm so happy that people had questions and you know, I always feel inadequate uh, answering them because it's it's really true that any single sentence can be used in a way that's harmful to a group of people, and everything is contextual. So it, it's that's a tough one. Well, and it, and it's it's very complicated. I, I have to admit, I I just didn't um, I didn't realize how complicated of a topic it is, and so this. This is something that I will for sure go back and listen to again. Um, but no, I, I thought you did very well answering the questions. So thank you for that. And thank you everyone for joining us. And um, you'll be receiving a link to this video tomorrow. So take care of everyone. Have a good night. Goodbye. Thank you all.